I'm John Potter, the director of the Phipps Center for the Arts. It's my great pleasure to welcome you and to thank you for choosing to spend your evening with us. The Phipps Center is presenting the play Population 485 by Michael Perry. Based on his book Population 485, Meeting Your Neighbors One Siren at a Time, through September 29th. Inspired by the New York Times best-selling book, which is hailed as a roadmap for building better communities, the Phipps Center decided to offer a forum on civil discourse. Tonight's forum is funded in part by a Creative Communities grant from the Wisconsin Arts Board with funds from the state of Wisconsin and the National Endowment for the Arts. Each of you should have received a brief survey along with a pencil when you entered the theater. If not, we'd be, we would be happy to provide one for you. We would appreciate it if you would complete them and give them to an usher when you leave. A diverse group of community leaders were invited to participate as panelists for this forum. Some did not respond, some were unavailable, and some chose not to participate. I am most grateful for the five panelists who chose to take part, as well as our moderator. When I asked Chancellor Dean Van Galen of the University of Wisconsin River Falls to recommend a moderator for tonight's forum, he suggested Dr. Neil Krauss, who I'm pleased to report immediately agreed to serve. Dr. Krauss has been a professor of political science at the University of Wisconsin River Falls since 2005. He teaches several courses in American politics and public policy and specializes in urban politics and policies. He's the author of two books, several journal articles, and is a frequent contributor to local and regional news organizations, including as the author of several articles for MinPost. Please welcome Dr. Krauss, who will introduce our panelists. Thank, thank you, John. Um, as John said, I've, I've taught at the university for uh, about 14 years. I've taught uh, political science for about uh, 20 years in total. I just want to say a couple things, and then I'll introduce our, our panelists here in a moment. Um, you know, it's always been difficult to discuss topics like, like race, immigration, uh, demographic population changes, and so forth. But I think, you know, we've all noticed in the last few years, things have gotten much worse along these lines. You know, as somebody who teaches large number of students, I mean, I hear stories all the time from students and from other people um, about how members of their family don't talk to each other anymore because of a disagreement about one or another of these kinds of issues. And I've also seen these, uh, these debates and um, you know, disagreements play out in my own extended family uh, as well. So I think you know, most of us have some kind of experiences with you know, the difficulty of talking about some of these, these complicated and sensitive issues. Uh, but in this climate, what we see happening really is individuals with different views are seen as less than human which makes it much, easy, much easier to dismiss or, or ignore them, uh, or worse. And you know, I think leaders who encourage these divisions, I think they fail us. And world history is full of examples where leaders intentionally created divisions among the citizenry to advance their goals. Yeah, I think as we would agree, divide and conquer is a, a very old technique. Yet at the same time, democracy depends on citizens being informed and part of the process of becoming informed involves listening to one another, including to individuals who are different from ourselves and recognizing that we do share the same world, even as our experiences in this world vary significantly. Hopefully our discussion tonight can be at least a step in the direction of creating more constructive dialogue. So with that, I just want to uh, introduce uh, the panelists, and, and each of the panelists were uh, you know, are, are going to talk for about six to eight minutes or so uh, with some observations from their particular perspective. We have people representing, um, you know, different professions, uh, different expertise, and so forth. Uh, and I'll introduce folks from, from my left to your right. I'll introduce everyone, and then we'll, we'll start with uh, Dr. Elaine Bauman. Dr. Uh, Bauman is a retired principal of River Falls High School, and uh, she graciously agreed to participate tonight. Jim Harsdorf, next to, next to Elaine, served in the Wisconsin Assembly 
as the floor leader in the Wisconsin Senate, as well as in the governor's cabinet as the Secretary of the Department of Agriculture, Trade, and Consumer Protection. Next to, to Jim is Dr. Cindy Kernahan, uh, Professor of Psychology at UWRF, whose expertise is racism and, and prejudice. And then on my right, uh, Dr. Ashkan Kilich, who, is, uh, Muslim, who, who was a Muslim panelist of Different Voices, Shared Visions, on River Channel Television, and he's also a professor of management and marketing at UWRF. And then finally, uh, Reverend John Lestock, uh, the senior pastor of Bethel uh, Lutheran Church here in Hudson. So uh, with that, I'll uh, just sort of remind people of the format. We'll give each of the panelists, again, about six to eight minutes to, to talk about this issue from their particular perspective. And then at that point, um, we'll turn it over for uh, questions from the audience, observations, comments, whatever that you have. And, and hopefully, um, you know, we'll have plenty of time for that. So, so on that note, I will turn it over to uh, Dr. Bauman. Thank you, Dr. Krauss. Um, I'm, uh, my experience has primarily been in K-12 education, uh, both as a principal in the school system, a neighboring school system, but also experiencing school systems throughout the Midwest uh, during a few years of school accreditation work after my, in my encore career. So um, when I discuss uh, encouragement uh, of constructive dialogue in K-12 schools, I guess I would like to start with a few assumptions that we can share or that I hope we will share. First of all, all children, you know, compulsory education K-12 um, creates some sort of, some form or some format of education for all students uh, up through the 12th grade or, uh, you know, thereabouts. So all children experience education at this level, either in a public school, a private school, online or homeschool setting. So, you know, that there, there is that common thread. Uh, current best practices acknowledges that learning takes place best where children and students feel safe and where their social and emotional needs are met along with their academic needs. How schools create safe and social emotional environment, safe social and emotional environments uh, with increasing diverse, diverse academic, religious, and racial backgrounds is a challenge. Schools reflect the population of their communities and are at the forefront of managing the integration of any newcomers or diverse groups. Even in communities with little racial diversity, there is still diversity in economic situations, academic abilities, interests, sexual orientation, and family makeup. Schools need to respond to that diversity with equality and equity. The challenge is approached at several levels. So the first is that we have adults to adults and how they uh, can continue or carry on constructive dialogue in the face of perhaps uh, conflict. The second is adults to children, and the third is children to children. So um, schools, school communities are kind of a closed system in some ways in that school districts have the ability and sometimes the obligation, perhaps let's just say not sometimes, has the obligation, have the obligation to promote cultural awareness and ways to conduct constructive dialogue uh, among adults and with students um, so that different viewpoints and often you know, can be aired and often that you can achieve conflict resolution. As employees of a public school or a school institution, there are expectations for employment and there are opportunities for training that can be used and should be applied consistently, involving listening skills and understanding your student population. Many schools have adopted mission statements or philosophies that support, promote, and teach positive student language and behavior. This will come in the form of direct instruction, guidance counselor uh, courses, or uh, uh, you know, in, in classes, uh, you know, uh, I'm trying to, health classes, for instance. Um, and then will come also in the form of embedded and existing courses, special guidance groups, sometimes posters and slogans and messages through the school campus, 
special school activities and recognitions, and probably most effectively, adult role modeling and vigilance with intervention to redirect and correct non-productive language. That does not mean that they disavow a conflict. It means that how do we positively resolve that conflict? Schools have adopted programs and techniques such as peer mediation or re or, and restorative justice interventions or circles in ways of teaching how to appropriately and effectively air opposing points of view, express those points of view, acknowledge and uh, the points of views of others, and setting a formal procedure that will allow all voices to be heard and resolution hopefully to be achieved. As in all institutions, the effectiveness of these efforts is dependent on the leadership, both among the adults and the students. I've had the great pleasure of seeing visionary student leadership embrace diversity with support groups uh, for students who might otherwise be significantly marginalized in a school environment. In a supportive environment, students are open to learn about other cultures and their practices. Some schools go so far as to provide culture classes so that without espousing a certain belief system can provide experiences and information for students to learn objectively about other cultures. Finally, um, schools are obligated to function with equality and equity. Equality generally refers to equal opportunity and the same levels of support for all segments of the school population. Equity goes a step further and refers to offering varying levels of support depending upon the need to achieve greater fairness of outcomes. Both of those are basic tenets um, of, of public schools and most faith-based schools have also espoused those as part of their faith-based philosophy. And at this point, I will turn it back. Okay, mm -hmm. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you, Elaine. Um, Jim. Well, they probably could have found somebody from office right now to talk a little bit about politics, but I figured we were the ones that all believed in free speech to be on the panel. First of all, I want to thank John Potter and the Phipps Center for hosting this discussion on civil discourse. To me, it's very timely. If we look for a definition of civil discourse, we find it's described as an engagement in conversation to enhance understanding. Seems fairly simple to me, but what has happened since uh, Mario Salvo, who many of you may not remember, began the free speech movement at Berkeley back in 1964? Triggered actually by the denial of any kind of political activity on campus. Well, certainly a lot of things changed since then. But now you fast forward to 2019 and Berkeley banned a conservative activist to speak on campus because they were worried that it might offend somebody. I think for those of us who were involved way back in the 60s and 70s, we're surprised to see that kind of change. In politics, labels such as liberal or far left or moderate and far right exist. Parties and leaders have to deal with the extreme within their own party. Both extremes have to be reacted to, but at the same time, if you eliminate the far left or the far right, the vast majority of people are actually moderates in the middle. I always say moderates were the people that guaranteed to make enemies left and right. <laughs> Unfortunately, compromise has become a dirty word. I can recall serving as floor leader in the Senate under a situation where we actually had some balance of power in the legislature, which I, I think is actually healthy. One party control can be very dangerous. We had a Democrat governor we had an unemployment compensation fund that was a billion dollars in the hole. And true leadership 
he invited all four of the leaders to come in and say, you guys put together a package which is going to affect employees as well as affect business, and I'll support it. What could have been a very contentious issue was totally resolved, not easily, but we came up with a plan, solved the unemployment compensation fund, and people shared in the burden, and it never became a political issue. Unfortunately, the danger can be on the other side. I think we would have health care reform if you don't decide just to do it from one side of the aisle. It would be beneficial to always understand the best way is to keep people at the table. Well, I grew up across the river in Stillwater. And I was interested in government way back then. In fact, uh, in the building of the Allen S. King power plant, they held the hearings, the public hearings, at our school. And we had flex scheduling, so I sat in on them. And I tell you this story because what was interesting about it, at the age of probably 14 or 15, I'm listening to the discussion. The environmental community wanted actually a nuclear power plant at that time because they thought it was cleaner and more efficient. NSP, which is now XL Energy, decided to go with a low sulfur coal plant. The plant was built, but a compromise to the environmentalists was to build a 730-foot tower to guarantee you'd spread the particulate all over. <laughs> Fast forward 10 years later, well, it's probably 10 or 12, I'm in the legislature in Wisconsin. And I end up serving on a ledge council committee to deal with acid rain. And the scientists that came in and tried, the alleged council study committees were designed to try and uh, guarantee you had input from a broad sector of people before the legislature gets involved. Anyway, um, the scientists came in and said, the worst thing you could do is build a high tower and spread the particulate if you want to control acid rain. And then I came back and I, I, I dairy farm now, and now we add which was not a bad thing that they put scrubbers on the plant to keep the sulfur out, but now we spend thousands of dollars on that to put sulfur on our soil. Um, I wanted to share some examples of bipartisanship that shows throughout history it works. The 64 Civil Rights Act was done on a bipartisan basis. The 77 Food Stamp Program was done on a bipartisan basis. The 86 Tax Reform the 90 American Rural Disabilities Act, the 96 welfare reform, and yes, even this year, 2019, the criminal justice reform was done on a bipartisan basis with pressure and support from both the president as well as the legislature. It's important that that is understood how important that can be. But today we face the challenge that there's a danger of identity politics, where sex, sexuality, gender, race, or ethnicity, instead of divine sovereignty of the individual, to pursue their dreams. Identity politics is really ripping the country apart, and it's a recipe of endless struggle and division. The Huffington Post made a statement that I thought I would just share. Today we are surrounded by politicians who have decided that honesty requires that they show how deeply they detest each other and a public that feels free to display its contempt for any with whom it disagrees. Our opponents have become our enemies and our enemies have become monsters. This has become true for all political factions and all political factions believe it is true only for their opponents. The idea that it is proper to hide and suppress our malice because not doing so is bad manners has been lost on all levels. With this has been lost the idea that it is possible to disagree on important matters yet respect and even honor your opponent. That is one of the sad things that we've lost. I want to share a couple ideas that I think that we can make a difference on. For example, the Chamber of Commerce this last year changed how they rank legislators in their voting record. They actually put in a provision that if people work together on both sides of the aisle on the issue, they actually get credit for that. I've never heard that before. 
That's pretty amazing. And these are my last five tips, and then I'll be done. <clears throat> Allow the other person to state his or her opinion. My recommendation tips. Don't interrupt. Allow others to make their feelings heard. Two, ask questions. If you disagree, respect by asking pertinent questions. Number three, don't shout. I've been at meetings where people shout. Thank you for not shouting. Four, educate yourself on important issues. And five, vote, because you really have no reason to complain if you haven't voted. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks, thanks, Jim. Uh, Cindy. Thanks a lot for coming out. I heard it raining, so it's <laughs> nice of you to be here. I think when we started, the sirens were going off, so I don't know if that's a good or a bad sign. I'll take it as a good sign. Um, so I think I was asked to do this because I'm a social psychologist by training. I teach courses about racism and prejudice. I teach courses about social psychology, which encompasses a lot of things like aggression and prejudice and relationships and marriage and and all sorts of things like that that can be difficult to talk about. And in my 20 years of teaching, um, I've tried very hard to understand how best to talk about these sorts of things in ways that don't obviously alienate students. You know, when you're working with a class of, of college students, you want to you want to you want them to learn. I want them to learn, and so you have to sort of figure out ways in which to talk about things so that people will listen. And so when I, when when I was asked to do this. Um, I was like, can I just think of like good things to say that would translate outside of the classroom and also that didn't sound trite? You know what I mean? Like you think about civil discourse, it's like, oh yeah, listen, oh yeah. Like <laughs> it sort of sounds like all these cliched ideas. And so my big fear is like, I don't want to sound cliched. So I started trying to really think about um, what does it mean to actually listen and hear other people? And also, why is it that it's hard? Why is it difficult? If you really pay attention, um, if you really pay attention to what you experience when you disagree with another person, like even in your body, like how does it feel? At least for me, it feels really tight, you feel uncomfortable, you don't like it. It just happened to me yesterday. I was driving in River Falls, which is where I live, and the guy in front of me had this bumper sticker that said, Wisconsin's full, go home. And I... <laughs> I was sort of like, what does that bumper sticker mean? Is that like an anti-immigrant bumper sticker? Is that just like anti-Minnesota? What is that? You know, I wasn't sure. I'm not originally from here, so I didn't really know. And But it, I look at it, and I was just sort of watching my reaction to it, and, and it's sort of uncomfortable. Like, what's who is this guy? You know. So then I'm looking at his car, and I'm making all these assumptions about him, and of course, that's what we do. So again, it sounds trite. It is sort of cliched, but you know, that's what we do. You have this feeling, and that's sort of what you go with. And so then I was thinking about all the research I've done on teaching and how to do this. Um, and so keep that in mind that we sort of we have this um, we have this uncomfortable feeling that we have. And so I was trying to think through in that research, like, well, what what is that? Like, why do we have that? Why do I care if this guy thinks Wisconsin is full? I don't think it's full. Like, why does that matter? And I think it's because we want to be validated at a really basic level, right? We want other people to share our, our view of the world. We want them to see it in the way that we do because that's very comforting. If someone sees it in a way that's different, that's very uncomfortable. So that's one thing I sort of thought about. Another thing, too, has to do with all the stuff I did after I saw the bumper sticker, right? I'm looking at his car, and I'm thinking about it, and I'm, like, adding all this stuff. I bet he thinks this. I bet he does that. I don't know any of this stuff. Like, I have no idea. He's just a guy in a Saturn in front of me. I have no clue. But that's the thing that we do, right? That's the, that's the and it's a very human thing. Um, as a social psychologist, I can tell you that, like, when you see someone, your brain just sort of Google autofills, right? All sorts of stuff pops in um, because you, there are things that you know, and, and you want that function. That function is useful. It helps us to think and get through the world more quickly than we would otherwise. So that's a good thing. But, of course, it's double-edged. It can also be a bad thing when you make all those assumptions and you're wrong. I don't really know the guy in the Saturn, so I'm not sure. So what are the things that can help? So again, going back to my teaching research and thinking about these ideas about we want to be validated and we, we want to make assumptions. So one thing that I think is helpful is to 
focus on feeling secure in ourselves. That sounds like a very psychologist thing to say, but it's very true. If you can focus on yourself in a broader context, so let's say you're in the moment, you're having a discussion with someone else, you disagree with what they're saying. This happens to me many times when my students say things in class that I know don't fit what I've taught them, or I disagree with, or they, I just know that they, you know, they have it wrong. Like, what a, at least I think they do, right? See what I'm doing? And, and so what can I do in that moment? Do I really want to focus on that thing? And instead, maybe I focus on myself when I'm having arguments with my brother, for example, about politics. Like, do, do I really need to do that? Or can I focus on myself in a larger context and in a way make myself bigger in that moment so that I don't need to be validated by that other person's feelings? I don't need for them to share the worldview that I hold because I'm feeling secure in myself, for lack of a better word, right? I think that's a very useful thing to do. And there's a whole bunch of research I could cite and throw at you, but I want you to stay awake, so I won't do that. But there's a lot of work on that that shows that. The other thing is that, um, and again, this sounds very cliched, but it's very true, thinking about letting other people be individual people rather than adding on all of those assumptions. So one of my one of the books I just finished recently is called How to Be an Anti-Racist. It's a really interesting book. It's written by a historian, Ibram Kendi, who um, studies what I study and is, is interested in, teaches about race. And he talks about this idea of what is a racist? What does it mean for someone to be a racist? That's a very loaded word. And especially for white people, if, that, if you get labeled in that way, right, that's very uncomfortable. But what does that even mean? And what he argues is that what it means is someone who espouses racist ideas. But it's not like a bone in your body. It's not like a, it's not like a tattoo that you have. It's malleable. It moves. All of us might express racist ideas at one point or another. And then we express anti-racist ideas. And so at a basic level, I can look at that other person and say, well, they might be saying things here, but that doesn't make them that. It's what they're saying right now. But it doesn't... I don't need to add a label to it or add something to it. And so I think, I've been thinking a lot about that idea of letting people grow and change and not es essentializing, essentially, right? Like turning it into that's who they are as a person. The last thing I would say that I think is important, just things to remember, um, two things maybe. One is in a lot of the disagreements that we have, we probably all agree on what the problem is. The issue is that we don't often agree on the solution, right? So you think about something like immigration, for example. That's a space where some people see immigration as the cause of a problem. Some people see it as a solution to a problem. But everybody feels the same sort of problem. Like it doesn't feel like the country is where it should be, for example, just to be really broad about it. So I think that's why we talk past each other, because we all feel, we sense something is wrong. We want things to be better, but we don't agree on the solution. So that's one thing to keep in mind. The other is that I think part of why civility gets a bad rap is because it's sometimes used in many ways as a way to keep people quiet, particularly people who might have in the past traditionally and in the present have less power and less ability. The fact is protest and demonstrations are never popular. They're never popular with people. Um, so, uh, you know, sometimes people will protest something and say, I, I don't like this policy, I don't like this idea. And it's like, well, you know, it's, it's fine for you to feel that way, but your tone is wrong. You should be more civil about it. And I think that's why civility often, um, it, it can be misused in that way. But if we back up and really think of it as, as just sort of honestly trying you know, not to make as many assumptions about other people as we do, and to think about being secure in ourselves, I think it can be useful. So I, I just wanted to throw that out as I think one of the reasons why we misunderstand um, when we think about and talk about these ideas. Thanks. Thank you, Cindy. Ajkan. I have to turn it down a little bit. Good evening. Uh, I first want to thank John Potter for having me here. And I also want to thank Dr. Neil Krauss for moderating this uh, forum and panel. Uh, dear guests, welcome. And I hope uh, that we'll have an enjoyable night where uh, we discuss how to discuss. So. Uh, before going into uh, the experience, sharing some of my experiences, I just want to introduce myself briefly. Uh, I'm a marketing professor and teach marketing. Uh, I'm not an expert in political science, neither in psychology 
or neither in religion. I just want to share my experience as someone who has lived in different countries with different identities or being different. So I was born in Turkey. I grew up in Germany, was raised in Germany, spent 14 years of my life in Germany. Started my professional life in Turkey and then made the move over here uh, 15 years ago. Now I'm here and I consider myself as a part of this community, of this country. So uh, I just want to talk out of experience how it feels to be different and how it is like to, to, to get by and try to communicate with those who perceive you as different. Uh, usually uh, people don't, can't tell because you know, I'm, I have green eyes and I used to have, uh, I was blonde <laughs> and yeah, I, so, and I'm white, so there's no problem to fit in, but once I start with my accent, uh, people start to communi uh, the thing and you can tell. So anyway, so I'm a, a professor in marketing and I teach marketing. So as a marketer, uh, I know how to get along with people. So uh, this, is, this is our job and I also teach uh, professional selling and I believe uh, this is what really brings people together communication, and this, this is what we teach. So I, uh, I'm an expert in civility, but I, I checked a, a couple of definitions what civility is. According Webster, uh, civility is civilized conduct or a polite act or expression. So it's a civilized conduct or a polite act or expression. There's an institute of civility in government. I didn't know that, so I found out. And it says, civility is claiming and caring for one's identity. So who I am and what I am. Claiming for one's identity, needs and beliefs without degrading someone else's in the process. So you stick to your identity, you claim your identity, you live your identity, but you don't degrade the other ones. This is civility. And I think it's really not hard to do so. But when we look how people practice it, uh, we, we, we can easily tell that uh, we, need, we have long ways to go to, be, to, to have a civilized conduct. So unfortunately, so, uh, so civility is about more than just politeness. Although politeness is a necessary first step, it is about disagreeing without disrespecting. So we can disagree. Nothing wrong with that. And seeking common ground as a starting point for dialogue about differences, listing past one's preconceptions and teaching others to do the same. Civility is the hard work of staying present even with those with whom we have deep-rooted and fierce disagreements. So these disagreements can be fierce, but shouldn't create hostility. I mean, this is very, it's, it's common sense, but I don't know why it doesn't happen or we see the opposite. So I'm blessed to be a part of a community forum here in Hudson. We define ourselves as different voices, shared visions. And the last eight years or so, we, we, we get together three, two, three times, discuss and, and share our perspectives. Uh, the forum constitutes of, of members from different faith, religious backgrounds. We have Jewish, Christian, and myself as a Muslim representation. We believe differently. Our faith is in God. We practice our beliefs differently, call ourselves differently, but yet we have shared visions about today and in the future. So being different but having the same vision, I think maybe that's, that's the key, what we should try to accomplish. We, have the, we should have similar visions, but we can, be, we can be different. We don't necessarily agree in the way we practice our beliefs because we do practice our beliefs differently. This doesn't make us good or bad people, but this makes us just different and sincere in our differences. But one thing that guides us in the vision of living together in harmony and peace, so we want to live in harmony and peace. This is the main guidance we follow and I think we, we represent a good example, the four or five of us, and we've been doing this for eight years, and uh, I don't see them, but uh, 
I, I'm very proud of, of, of my brothers and sisters. We call ourselves brothers and sisters because we really feel that way. So our collaboration may be an example of how to get along and discuss and practice civility. Please allow me to explain in more detail the guidelines we follow. There are several guidelines, uh, like Mr. Harstoff mentioned. It, it's, it's very simple. We first respect each other because we are all brothers and sisters, descendants of Adam and Abraham. I mean, I have to put a religious aspect in there. I mean, <laughs> so, and we sincerely believe the first creation of, of the humankind, God has blown a part of his into us as our soul. So we're, we're a part of, of, of God. So how can we disrespect each other if we believe in God? I mean, only this should be enough to get together and embrace what we have and share what we have. Second, we first agree on what we want to talk and identify the boundaries of the discussion topic. So if you don't set the boundaries, it can fly around. And so you, you first need to define what you want to discuss. We aim to share our perspectives and not necessarily dictate our views and convert others. There's, there's, there's no reason to convert each other. It's almost impossible pe because people are who they are and they believe the way they believe. There's no reason to start a conversation with the purpose of dictating anything. That's what we believe in and it works. We do not argue because we know it will not help to make our case. We, c we listen carefully and are more than happy to agree with each other if this is the consensus eventually we reach. The consensus, if there's three, four, the fifth one agrees also because it's the majority. What, 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 what uh, the majority? Uh, the majority believes in them. We are grateful to have a platform to share our differences. We know that God has created us with all the differences we have. It is His will. How can He possibly be against this? Because we we don't have any any how to say it uh, power to to create a. We are created differently, so we have to embrace it. We try to be a better person by learning from each other. And maybe the last aspect is, I, I just wrote, wrote it while I was listening to the other panelists. I think, and that's what I actually also teach in my sales class. I say, you have to put your ego jacket aside. Take it off. There's no ego. Where e where ego creates the, the, the divide. But if we consider ourselves as one and a part of one, then it's, it becomes a lot easier. So I think I don't know um, how many. Because, yeah. because okay, good. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thank you. That was John, and finally, um, John. Well, folks, I too want to thank John Potter and the Phipps for uh, staging this, uh, inviting us all here, and I want to thank you for being here. And uh, I am John Lestock. I'm the senior pastor over here at uh, Bethel Lutheran Church in town. Uh, so I'm the token pastor here. I'm the guy with the collar on. As I look around, I think the only collar I see, although I do see a, another colleague or two out there. Um, you know, there's no way that any pastor can stand up here and speak on behalf of all the faith community. But as I stand here, I'd like to, I'd like to call your attention to um, something that I think is really unique in the faith community, and it's this. Um, people of faith, and especially the Christian faith, really have been founded on diversity. Not just unity, but diversity as well. And let me give you some examples of that. Um, you recall the, the 12 motley crew that Jesus pulled together for his disciples? Uh, there were fishermen, there were, there were some hotheads called the Sons of Thunder. What was that about? Um, uh, but there's also a tax collector. And if, if you recall your history, or if you know anything of the Bible, you know, a tax collector was a traitor to the Jewish state. They had sold out to the Romans. But meanwhile... Jesus also had a zealot. And if you're familiar with, uh, with what a zealot was, they were people that were totally committed to slitting the throats of any traitor 
uh, to the state of, of Israel that they could find. So think with me, 12 disciples, I've only named about four or five there, but how many nights did Jesus have to sleep between Simon the Zealot and Matthew the tax collector to keep them from slitting each other's throat? I want to suggest to you, this was no accident. Jesus specifically chose a diversity of people from all different walks of life. So from the very start, this was an exercise in unity, but also in diversity. And if you know anything about Christian history or the Bible, you also know uh, from then on uh, with uh, some of the other disciples, uh, you uh, guys like Peter and Paul were often at, uh, at odds with one another, are arguing over the issue of circumcision. Do you have to be circumcised to be in the church or don't you? And they, they had some doozy of, uh, of arguments and, and headbutting about that. Uh, you may also know that later on in Christian history, um, Paul and Silas went one way, Peter and John another. It wasn't just because they were going different directions to try to touch the rest of the world. Sometimes these guys didn't want to be around each other because they had differences of opinion. Again, I'm not minimizing the unity of Jesus, the unity of Christ, but within that unity, there was also diversity. And we often minimize that, forget that, or don't see that. Uh, I'll throw one more out here too, uh, and, and that was in the early church, the big tension of, uh, is the church just for Jews or is it for Gentiles as well? And again, if you know your Bible history, read the book of Acts, read, uh, what is it, Acts 10, you'll recall that uh, this good Jewish boy by the name of Peter has this revelation where basically God says, you know, all those things you learned as a good Jewish boy, well, you can throw those out because things are changing now. And now we're opening the doors wide. This is not an exclusive little group anymore. This is an inclusive group. And uh, so again, there, there were lots of reasons that people were butting heads in the early church. Uh, but again, they survived it. Uh, and in many ways, that was part of their strength. Friends, think with me right now. I mean, even to this day and age that you and I live in, you know, we, we, we have Christendom. We have a Christian church, not just in this country, but throughout the world. But how many thousands, and there, there are thousands, by the way, thousands of denominations. We live under one moniker of all for Jesus, but we don't all agree of how we go about do, you know, worshiping and how, uh, you know, how we go about serving God. We, we have some very different interpretations of that. So that's part of the tension that the Christian faith really was founded on. I mention that because it seems to me people of faith, and especially Christians, we, we ought to be champions of learning how to work with diversity. So often, that's not our story. So often we're rigid and inflexible, and, and it's my way or it's no way. So that, to me, that's very troubling, and I would imagine for many of you it is as well. The second tension that I see uh, in, in, the, in the faith community is this. Um, Jesus was the great reconciler. At least as I read the scripture, he was always pulling people in, often from the fringes, often the very people that everybody else wanted to exclude. Jesus was including them. He was the great reconciler, but I also want to call to your attention uh, that within the faith community, and, and again, I'll, I can speak most accurately, I think, with Judaism and Christianity, there's also a prophetic edge that we have. You know what I mean? A prophetic edge. And there are things that go on in life and the world or around us that we can't be silent about. Our faith calls us to stand up and say, you know, um, I may respect what you believe, but I need to go on record as saying, this is not what's in the scripture. This is not the way that God sees it. I, I remind you, Jesus uh, used that prophetic edge many times, but uh, you remember Jesus throwing the money changers out of the temple? You know, there was an issue where he just couldn't be silent. He just couldn't zip his lip. Uh, it would be nice that everybody got along, but there's times you got to take a stand on things. Uh, I would also call to your attention that uh, Jesus seldom had harsh words for those that were on the peripheral. 
but he often had harsh words for those that were front and center, the, the religious type, the, the folks that wore the collars, the, the self-righteous that thought that they had all the answers and there was no room for anybody else. Those are the ones that Jesus took on. And last but not least, I remind you, if you're familiar with Matthew, Matthew 25, uh, I think most people both within and outside the church know uh, this parable of the sheep and the goats and, and Jesus saying, when I was hungry, you were there to give me food. When I was thirsty, you were there to give me drink. When I was a stranger, you welcomed me. And the people say, well, when did we do that? And Jesus basically in the punchline is, whenever you did it for the least of my brothers, the least of people, you did it for me. So there are some things, again, in the tension, uh, we, we all want to get along, we want to be reconcilers, but there are some times uh, that we just can't keep quiet. And uh, we need to stand up and make a statement. And again, it's not that everybody will agree with us. But uh, again, Jesus was one that stood with the weak, the vulnerable, the least, the lost, the lonely. Those were at risk. And uh, you know, I mean, one of the subtitles of our gathering tonight is, has to do with immigration and refugees. And uh, you and I can come up with a million reasons why Jesus didn't mean these things that he said. But I want to suggest to you, he, he did mean them. He did mean them. And uh, we can backpedal and, uh, you know, ecclesiastically try to talk ourselves out of it. But there are things that God stands for. And there are things that God stands against. So uh, that's one of the bottom lines that I would call to your attention tonight. Uh, 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 let me just kind of end things off with this. Uh, some of you are familiar with Tony Campolo. Tony Campolo was a sociologist, taught at Eastern in uh, Pennsylvania years ago. But uh, Tony, for me, has been a great hero and a, and a spokesperson in many ways. But Tony's thing, what, when he finds groups that are deadlocked over any issue, whether it's in the church or outside of the church, here's an adage that he brought. And, and he really helped my former congregation down in Oatana when we were struggling with some things that really did divide us. We had people at all points in the spectrum. Tony, Tony's adage was simple. Are you willing to admit the possibility that you may be wrong? Am I willing to admit the possibility that I may be wrong and you may be right? And on the flip side, are you willing to entertain the possibility that you may be wrong and I may be right? And Tony's, Tony's simple adage is simply, unless we're both willing to have that sort of humility, which, and by the way, humility is supposed to be a part of our faith, no matter what faith we're a part of. Unless we have that sort of humility, we can't really talk civilly. We can't really discuss ideas. All we're doing is lobbing hand grenades over a fence unless I'm willing to entertain the possibility that I could be wrong. You know, friends, uh, as people of faith, uh, and again, whether we're Christians, Muslims, Jews, whatever, we ought to be the shining example of how we deal with diversity in the midst of unity. But so often we are nothing but poster children for bad behavior. And, uh, and that, that's troubling. And, and why is that? So again, uh, my challenge for myself, for you, me, the next person, is that we, we take a step back and take a good look at our history and our roots and say, they could do it. We can do it. We can learn to work together and live together in ways that, uh, again, don't, uh, don't give away the farm, but at least we can speak civilly to one another. And when needed, we can stand up and make those statements that, uh, again, are in black and white in the scripture. When I was hungry, you gave me food. When I was thirsty, you gave me drink. When I was a stranger, you were the one that opened the door for me. I hope that's, uh, I hope that's part of who you and I can be. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, John. So now uh, we want to hear from the, the audience. Um, if you have a question for any, any one of the panelists or more than one, if you have um, an observation, a comment, uh, Colin uh, is going to walk around, uh, and he and I are going to try to find people here. Uh, so I just, you just put your hand up, and he'll find you with the microphone, and uh, we'll just go from there. 
Oh, okay. And then we have a gentleman in front as well. But um, thank you yeah, all for the FIPS and for putting this on. I want to um, also offer thanks to um, Jim. You might not remember me, but you were helpful when, we, when my husband and I were in the process of adopting from Korea and breaking down some walls. And we now have two 30 plus year old Korean American kids who live in this community. So thank you for that. And Elaine for <laughs> helping getting them through the school system, <laughs> which was no small thing. I, I would like to hear from all of the panelists what you think the role of social media may play in kind of escalating this sense of discord that, you know, lack of civility, I guess, is the, is the theme. And from that, I'd love to hear from everyone. Yeah, I mean, I'll let anybody who didn't really address that directly, but uh, I'll let anybody jump in who wants to, wants to speak to that. Well, I think one of the things that you can observe legislatively compared to when I served, compared to now, the speed at which information gets back to the general public um, is unbelievable just because of Facebook, um, email, text, and one of the things that, I mean, by itself, information is not a bad thing. That's a good thing. But you have organizations which take and may impugn the motives of a vote before that person even has a chance to explain that vote. And I think that's the danger of social media and the speed by which it impacts the process. Does anybody else want to chime in on that one or not necessarily? on social media? Oh. I would second that. <laughs> my, my son is in DC. Uh, he's with the National Conference of State Legislatures, but uh, he too would say it, it's the immediacy of the news that we see, or well, supposed news. It's, it's the immediacy of the things that are reported. And his, his point, uh, and the point of you know, many of the legislature is, there's no time to step back to ask the good, hard questions of, is this true? It, uh, you know, and how do I thoughtfully respond as opposed to just making a knee-jerk reaction? So uh, yeah, I, I so agree with what you say there. It's, uh, um, w we need more time to reflect. We need more time to gather the facts. We need more time to uh, you know, make an intelligent response as opposed to having to shoot from the hip on the spot. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to, to piggyback on that uh, time for response and time to think a response over. Um, I, I also teach uh, in the principal licensure program at the university communications, oral and, and written communications, and my advice uh, to my classes is first and foremost, you get an angry letter, which as an administrator you get, you read it, if you feel you need to write something, write something offline, and then the next morning, delete it. Um, think things over. Uh, you know, do you need to have the last word? What, where do you need to go with your response? Do you need to move it forward, or do you need to have revenge? Uh, you know, the, again, uh, in, in a leadership position, being the bigger person is where you want to go. You want to remember, what are we working for? We're working for the good of kids. So uh, my, as I say, the cardinal rule is do not respond to an angry letter right away. And, and oftentimes as an administrator, it'll be late at night after a basketball game and you're tired. You know, don't do it. So uh, the, the time, a delay in response um, is, is, never, is never regrettable. I mean, there are things, yes, that you need to respond to. But um, g give yourself time to think, time to cool off. Uh, time to format a positive step response. Anyone else have any anything on that one on social media? Should be waiting periods, right? To respond, right? <laughs> um, yeah, um, I think we have a question right here. Yeah, the woman in green, Colin. Thank you. Yeah, I have a question for the um, members of the panel that are working with college students. Can you speak to the level of discourse that you see your students using and um, how they challenge each other? Is there diversity? And what's that like? What's it like with uh, 
Well, it's not what the press would tell you, I, I guess is my first reaction. I mean, I, I think there's this image of higher education out there that we're, we're all having, you know, everybody's speech is being chilled and there's like no one can talk and there's no discourse and that's really not my experience of it at all and not most of my colleagues. I mean, my, my students are incredibly respectful of each other. I mean, almost to the point where they don't, it's very difficult to get them to engage in, in a lot of dialogue sometimes just because, not because they're afraid necessarily, they feel chilled, it's like they wanna be nice to each other. They're incredibly nice to each other. I mean, that's been my experience of working with college students is that they're kind to each other. And they are thoughtful. They are, my students are very thoughtful. So I, I teach difficult con concepts a lot, you know, racism and prejudice, it's heavy stuff. A lot of social psychology can be really heavy stuff. I, I've taught the senior seminar course. I, I taught a class, um, Careers in Psychology, which was incredibly emotionally emotional, which was surprising to me. But you know, they're thinking about their careers, and they're they're very kind to each other. So I guess that's that's my response. And and they are thoughtful, and they and they're willing to think about lots of perspectives. So I, I think it's much better news than what you might what you might think, but I'll let my other college professor colleagues weigh in too. Do you wanna, so, yeah. so I would agree and concur with uh, Cindy. Uh, they're thoughtful. Uh, one issue is uh, they're, they're willing to express their thoughts, but I think they, they're looking for the right environment. If they feel comfortable with the professor, if the professor gives them the opportunity, uh, they, they're willing to talk. And sometimes you have to literally pull words out of their mouth, but eventually, uh, during time, after a few weeks, uh, they participate and 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 they they don't argue. They show respect to each other and uh, they share their perspectives. Maybe it's my my topic is maybe not that sensitive. It's marketing sales, but eventually, <laughs> so we, we, we talk. So uh, <laughs> but but uh, I believe sometimes uh, the difficulties with some students who are maybe first generation uh, type of students who, who are not used to speaking up freely, uh, I believe the professor has a big role in encouraging them and that's what we're doing. Um, you know, I would just say a couple things. I mean, I, I agree with what, um, what's been said thus far. I mean, I teach political science, so I deal with this, this, this issue all the time, I suppose. And uh, I do think what Cindy said is, is correct, that pe you know, students do uh, want to speak, uh, and you know, a certain number of students in every class will will speak and and you know take positions and disagree and agree and so forth. Um, you know, at the same time, I think you know what Ashton said is also true. I think it 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 depends on the instructor to a large extent. I mean, and I uh, in some cases I've done a better job than in other you know in some classes maybe than in other classes in terms of encouraging uh, encouraging and and. You know, students. I always, you know, say that I encourage everybody to speak and so on and so forth. If and I have noticed that if things get a little bit tense early in the semester, um, with me not having anything to do with it, but with students perhaps disagreeing with one another, then things by November, December get quieter. On the other hand, if there's more of a free flow early on, then uh, then th I think things tend to. Be more students tend to be more expressive later on in the semester, and I think a lot of that is on us as instructors to to keep that keep that going. Um, and it can be a challenge, right? If you, for example, follow the news at all, uh, I mean, it can be a challenge. And um, you know, uh, to to go in and to sort of say, okay, you know, does anybody have any thoughts on something that just occurred? Or or and I oftentimes when I ask that question, no. That there's going to be a lot of silence, and I'm I'm more comfortable with silence now after teaching for 20 years, and I so I I can wait it out. I don't get real nervous about it, and if I make enough jokes or something, then eventually maybe some people will, you know, say some things. But it does take some effort on our part, and and I think that if we you know practice at it, I think we can get better at it. So, yeah, somebody I know we have a gentleman here who's had his hand up for a little bit, and then we have somebody in, in back. Thank you for calling me gentlemen. Uh, I just want to tell the, uh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not good with names, the marketing professor, you're not the only one that talks with an accent. I do too, so ease up. And then I have a question for the psychologist. When you looked 
and evaluated the driver and the car and based on the bumper sticker. Did you also think that perhaps he bought the car that day from his brother-in-law? Uh, or wasn't even him. But the question that I have, and maybe that ties into immigration, I'm against the, quote, hyphen American. I mean, I'm from Germany. I'm an American. I'm not a German American. I gave that up when I came here. And we need to do that to unite, because everything gets to be classified. Uh, I don't care, African American, Norwegian American, and I'm from Lebanon. I really don't care. We're all in the same boat. We're all Americans now. So shut up and don't push your uh, separate deal. You can certainly talk your language at home, but when you get out in the public, it's English. That's all that's to it. And if you don't speak English, then it just bypasses you. And uh, the only other, if you think about the right or wrong, I've never been wrong. I've talked with people that were more right than I was, but I've never really been wrong. So thank you. So, um, I mean, d does anybody want to address the, the issue of you know, hyphenated Americans? Don't all speak at once, as they say. <laughs> So one thing I, I would say about that that I think makes it difficult to do that is that at different points in our history, it's been easier or harder for people to let go of that hyphen, you know? I mean, it's, and so I, I think that's something that's important to keep in mind is that it can be difficult not to be seen as a member of a group depending on the group, and that's an American history that's largely based on skin color. So I think that's something to keep in mind that can make it difficult to drop that. But I agree, I mean, I think it's really helpful to have a common identity, and it would be wonderful for us to get to that point. It's just we haven't necessarily been able to at that at, yet, and I think that's part of what makes it hard. That would be my comment. Yeah. So I was naturalized five years ago, and I'm very proud when I took the oath, I was proud I got goosebumps. So uh, sure, we're Americans, but my question would be, how do we feel about me being American? I mean, that's maybe the other question because we feel Americans who are naturalized, but uh, it's, it's more the question, uh, on paper we are, but how are we perceived as naturalized Americans? I, I assume, you, you have a very heavy accent, I'm sorry to say that, I mean, <laughs> German accent. I also speak German. And uh, the second with the, uh, the languages, I think the more language you speak, you should be able to practice your language. You're more, you're two people now. You're, I mean, you're, you're American, but you're also German because you, you can think in two different ways. And this is the richness of this culture. And this brings ris richness, and, ri richness and value to the community, to society, and to the economy. Uh, and for, I mean, I have to express my opinion once you said they should speak only English. Uh, I would say speaking more than one language should be encouraged. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah, does anyone else have anything on, on that on the panel? Or we, um, well, while I, yeah. while I was in office, uh, I had the opportunity to have several people who became citizens um, and to see their excitement about becoming an American and going through the process. In fact, right now I employ several um, Ecuadorians and one of them is working her way through to become a citizen. And I, I think historically, in fact, my grandfather came from Germany, so I'm a product of, of an immigrant at one point. Um, I think historically people felt when they came here they really wanted to be an American and I think that was healthy and it has been healthy and I think we need to encourage that kind of health of when you become an American citizen. Okay, um, Colin, yeah, we have a gentleman here and then we have at least one person over here. So, Oh wait, we have a couple, I'm sorry, right here, yeah. Well, thank you very much. I've I've had the opportunity to go to an interfaith meeting at the Cedar Riverside area of Minneapolis. Or, and if you hear about that, it's kind of in the news once in a while. But I found it's mostly college students, all different faiths. And I think forums like that are needed to people to start sharing. I, 
I'll just give you a couple things that I heard. There was a young lady from Vietnam, probably a Buddhist, that stood up and says, because I probably look like a Vietnam veteran aged person, she said, you know, my history books on Vietnam are quite a bit different than yours. That really struck me as it's really important. And then another young Muslim lady said, how, do you, how does your faith affect what you're doing? So we had a chance to discuss, each of us, about our faith. And then another couple, older couple, said, what we do is we have a dinner every Saturday night, and we invite over a couple that we probably would never get along with. <laughs> but I think, I guess the message I think is that I always feel like I don't think I'm going to go to the UN and solve a world problem, but I would like to help that I could help one family or one person someplace to feel integrated in this country. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, yeah, does anybody want, if anybody has any comments on that, uh, Colin, there's a gentleman yeah, on the aisle, a couple seats behind you. Yep. I think it's Kyle. It is Kyle. It is Kyle, okay. <laughs> so, um, I'm sorry, I missed your name too, but to the psychologist, you spoke on how the term civility can be weaponized against marginalized people. I was wondering if you could speak more on that, and as we all leave this forum to try and be more civil, how we can draw the line on what actual civility is and what is probably being weaponized as civility. Mm, yeah, that... That's a good question. What I meant, when, what I was thinking about is I was thinking about the ways in which people think about protest, right? And so, for example, the, the hot button issue, I guess it's been the last two football seasons uh, with the taking of a knee, right? So started by Colin Kaepernick. And there's a lot of discussion around, well, you know, I don't disagree with their message, but I don't like the way that they're doing it, they being the football players who've chosen to take a knee or to sit out the national anthem. And so a lot of smart folks during that period sort of made the point that protest has never been possible because I think some commentators during that period were saying things like, well, they're just not doing it in a civil enough way. But if you go back and you look at protests in the 1960s, for example, which is often held up as this great gold standard of protest, and it was in many ways, nonviolent protest, like it, if you, if you go back and look at that, back then, most Americans weren't in favor of that protest either. It's not like that was popular. So I think that idea that, well, it's not, it's not your message, it's just that you're doing it wrong. I think is, I find that to be disingenuous because people never really like protest if they're in favor of the status quo. You know, if you don't want it to change, it's gonna be difficult. You're not gonna see it in that way. So that's what I mean by weaponized. So I think we have to think a lot about is it really the way people are saying it or is it the message and get clear on what that is? Because I think it can be really dishonest to say you're just not being civil enough. You're just not being, you're not doing it right. You're not protesting. And even in an interpersonal way, if someone disagrees with you, I think it's, it can be hard if someone's disagreeing with you to really listen to their message because you say, well, they're just, they're saying it mean or they're saying it wrong or saying it something. I've found myself in that situation before but really trying to think through what am I actually reacting to here? Am I, am I reacting to the policy or the idea or is it really the tone? Because usually I think it's really the policy or the idea and thinking through that. I mean, unless someone's shouting at you, that's obviously different, but that's, I guess that would be the only thing I, I would add to that about how to think about going forward. I'm not sure if that exactly answered what you meant, but. Yeah, we have a uh, woman over here in the second or thir third or fourth row there, I think. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Hi, I have a couple of questions. Um, the first one is regarding immigration and refugees, is that I see a big problem is with the untruths that surround some of the things that they're talking about. And I'm wondering, um, you know, where should we be turning to gather facts to help quell the myths regarding that topic? So that's one question. And then the other mm. question is directed to you. Um, I was wondering if it was your church 
that was going to be a sanctuary church. And then there was uproar. I don't know if that's a fair word, but. It was St. Pat. It was St. Pat. Okay. So anyway, I was just wondering what happened there or if you knew anything about that. Uh, are you ready for that one, or you want to do this? <laughs> All right. This past month, the uh, and I believe we call it a uh, I'm, I'm I'm blanking on the term, but it's it's the uh, national church gathering, and at, at the national church gathering for the ELCA, there was a vote that the, that uh, ELCA churches uh, would have the freedom to become sanctuary churches. Now I say that because that they're not forcing that from the top down, they're saying, if this is what you choose, then that's your prerogative, we'll stand with you. If you choose not to do that, then you don't have to do that, which is kind of the church polity for the ELCA, whether it's gay marriage or whatever. Uh, no, things are not forced from the top down, it's the autonomy of the individual congregation. So, uh, and um, my understanding, and I, you know, for, for most, for many of us in the, in the ELCA and most of the congregations, this was a small blip on the screen. Uh, but for some folks uh, in the media, they ran with it, and I, I noticed on one of the broadcasts, they, they never had representation from somebody from the ELCA. They took the ball, made their own, um, uh, assumptions of what this was about, that it was anti-American, and ran with it, but without, you know, any representation from the ELCA. So uh, I'm not sure if that's the one you're referring to, but um, that's something that's been out there in the last few weeks. Do you want to, yeah, talk about the first, the first question, yeah. Yeah, so to the first question about where to get information, so um, you asked a college professor, it's sort of dangerous, right? Because um, I was immediately like, I can think of lots. Um, so I, I teach a section on immigration and my racism course, and I have a good friend who teaches in our College of Agriculture who teaches a course on immigration as well, and so I've seen some of her resources. And my recommendations are, one, the Pew Research Center is nonpartisan, and um, they are a great resource for information on this. They have, a, I think it's like a four or five part series that you can take online. It's like, a, they call it a course, but it's, 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 really, um, it's really quick to do. And it sort of goes through sort of the information about immigration if you want to learn more about how the policies work and who immigrants actually are and how it's changed over the years. It's really great, really great course um, that I ask my students to do. Another one, another nonpartisan institute is the Migration Policy Institute, or MPI. They um, also have a lot of information about migration patterns patterns and immigration to the US that I find very useful. And then finally, This American Life, which is a public radio show, they did a two-part series, I think it was two years ago now, on immigration, and they went in deep. They looked at the economics of it. They, I see other people nodding their heads. Um, they did a, and they had an economist come in. They looked at local jobs data for a small town in Alabama, and it was super interesting. Like, when one episode they did sort of the perspective of the migrants, and another episode they did the perspective of the small town that these folks we're moving into, and I strongly recommend that two-part series. I thought it was, I thought it was great. So those would be my recommendations. I would also uh, add to what Cindy said: um, newspapers. You know, um, it, it, and newspapers have facts in them <laughs> every day. I mean, you can go read an article, and, and if you don't like the New York Times, then read USA Today or the Wall Street Journal. Every single day, or the Star Tribune, which I subscribe to, and it's, it's an outstanding paper. Every single day, long stories on timely issues that have facts in them, right? Um, and I, it's sort of, on one hand, it's sort of obvious to say that, but, um, but I keep saying it, uh, to mostly to 18 and 19 and 20 year olds. But, um, <laughs> but you know, because if you're looking for facts about just basic stuff, well, how many potential refugees are, are coming into this country, or how many have already come, or those factual nuts and bolts type questions. If you go to a major paper and read a recent comprehensive article on that issue, uh, you will probably get some of those nuts and bolts type, you know, factual things in the, in the article. Um, 
you know, and of course, you know, public radio, public television, and, and so forth too. But uh, and it doesn't take a ton of work. And I always tell my students, it's, "Hey, look, I know we're, we're all pressed for time. It's not like we have to. None of us can can you know. Well, maybe some of us can, but you know, for two or three hours a day, that's not the expectation. But I mean, and I get a hard copy of the Star Tribune, and of course, I look at the website. And a lot of days, you know, go by days at a time where I, I don't open it, <laughs> and that's okay because there's no time. But then Sunday rolls around, or Saturday, or Thursday, or Friday. And, you know, I'll open it up and say, oh, wow, this is really, you know, quite a story about the groundwater in the East Metro, for example, <laughs> or about something Medtronic did that was a little fishy. <laughs> or the list goes on, right? Newspapers have that stuff every single day. And unfortunately, I think, you know, with the decline of papers and all the rest of it, um, and as I tell my students all the time, you, we can't hold government accountable at any level unless we know what government is doing. We can't just impossible, right? If we don't have a, just a basic working knowledge, and I think that newspapers, in whatever form you want to read them, I think can still do that. So I would just add to that. But um, Colin, had, uh, I don't know where Colin is now, but uh, there he is right here, yep. Yeah, um, for me, one of the elephants that's still in the room with us all here is President Trump. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't really know how to weave what I think about our president into a conversation of neighbors talking about the promise of a more civil discourse. But given the fact that we all seem to agree on the value of compromise, self-respect and respecting others, trying to understand perspectives, all that stuff which, you know, most of us are fortunate enough to see in our lives all the time. We have a president who is a racist and a misogynist and a serial sexual predator um, and a goofy businessman. And I don't know how to square that circle. I don't know what to say about that anymore because as far as I'm concerned, his behavior is simply wrong. It's not like if I understood his behavior better, we'd find some common ground. Or if we just could sit down and set aside our differences, we'd be able to understand one another better and, and have some respect. Um, you know, he's insecure, he's damaged, and he's doing a lot of damage to men and women all so, over the world. Okay. So what do we do with that? That's the $64 million question, man. Um, you know, I mean, it, I mean does anybody want to, 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 to speak to that? Does anybody want to say anything to that? besides me. I think, I think it's hard. It's extremely hard well, uh, on a number of levels. And, you know, I have a six-year-old and 11-year-old. I go and pick them up uh, at their public schools all the time, and I see posters on the walls about being kind, about being truthful, about all these things. And then I read the news, right? It's very hard. It's very hard on lots of people. And so... What do we do with it? I don't know. I've been trying to figure out for three years what, what we do about it. Um, because I know that things that the president has said and continues to say would get him fired from most jobs in America, would get your principal fired or your superintendent fired or your kid's first grade teacher fired. Not to mention in the private sector, you would get terminated. Not to mention you wouldn't have friends. <laughs> you know, I don't know. Because, it, because I, I, you know, there's a distinction between let's talk about the issues, whether it's immigration or what have you, and let's talk about character and things that we, we all agree on. We all agree on. Things like truth. <coughs> things like decency. Things like taking responsibility for your behavior. So I don't know. I don't know. It's... it's it's extraordinarily difficult, and, uh, and it's not easily dealt with. I, I don't think, 
Um, there's any easy answer. Um, but at some point, I would refer to what, what John said. I think people have to, to, to stand for something and not shrug and not say, well, some people think it's OK to call countries as whole countries, and other people don't. You decide. I don't want to be biased. I don't want to be subjective. Or some people think it's OK. You can go on and fill in all the rest. I decided right after the election I wasn't going to shrug and just say, well, it's up to you. I don't want to say anything of substance here, because that would be biased. That's not how we live our lives. None of us do, really. And so I made a decision early on I wasn't going to live that way. And if somebody's going to call me biased, because, yeah, I'm biased in favor of truth, fine. I'll, put, I'll wear a shirt that says that, you know, and all the rest of it. Yeah. I have yeah. a cop. Go ahead. I had alluded to the uh, prophetic voice, and uh, there's a prophetic voice in every major faith. I mean, Christians, Jews, Muslims, Buddhists, whatever. Uh, uh, I would certainly hope that we can, regardless of what our faith tradition is and what our politics are, that I would hope there would be something prophetic in each of us that, as you say, I don't care who it is or what party it's coming from, but when something is just a falsehood, something is a lie, uh, something just goes against the grain, that, that's that's where we need to stand up and speak out. And uh, this is not just a Donald Trump thing. This would be any time, any place, anywhere. Uh, but I think sometimes people of faith are lulled to, lulled to sleep, and uh, and uh, I sometimes we. We just don't have the backbone that we need. So. I, have a, I have a comment, if I may. I, I think Donald Trump's a result of tribalism, and my oh, comment yeah. is to the social psychologist. Um, we talked about diversity, but even tonight, most of the people here are white, so we don't have a lot of diversity here tonight. Japan doesn't, you don't immigrate to Japan. You don't go to live in China. You don't become citizens of China. I mean, our country has immigration, so it's a polygot country. Nonetheless, we have a very racist history. We've always been tribal. And now we're even more tribal. And we come up with, I think, we come up with character, characters or raisations of other races and other groups in order to compete. I mean, we've, we're really into fiefdoms all over here. And now we've gotten into nomenclature, you know, we're talk, calling each other names, et cetera. My question to you is, as a social psychologist, isn't it a great challenge for the United States of America to accept, you know, that we call it the melting pot? But I mean, really, anthropologically, we're still tribally based, I think. I mean, we still like to hang around with the people that make us feel safe, which well, so is the same kind of people we are, right? Well, would you agree with that? Yeah, well, the thing I would say to that, though, is that we decide who the people like us are. I mean, the constructs that we have are not that old. So the, the construct of race is, is really a construct that's like, what, 500 years old or something. It's not that old. We haven't always identified in that way. So yeah, we like people who are like us, but we can make new identities. We can make new groups, right? We can make, we can make a new group. We don't have to race is not essential. It's just a thing we made up to justify things. And we can make new ones. And so I guess I'm hopeful because I know that those things are malleable. And they shift a lot faster. I mean, when I say this in class, students will often, you know, oh, but it'll be hundreds of years and, you know, but not necessarily. I mean, look at the way attitudes have shifted. I'm not that old, but I'm old enough to know that, like, attitudes about gay and lesbian folks are way different now than they were when I was my college student's aides, you know, 25 years ago. It's different now. It doesn't take, I sound hopelessly naive, but it's not that hard to shift these things. It's not as hard as we think because a lot of these things are social constructs that we have agreed on, and we can agree on new ones. We can make them different. So I guess that's what I would say. Yes, we, we like our groups, but we can make new groups. Yeah. Yeah. Gentleman in the back, Colin, I see it. Oh. 
Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. You know, I think to the comment about the president, I think we have a challenge just in terms of what's going on of how people do treat each other in the debate of civility in politics. I mean, when you see candidates using the F word um, on, on TV and going, how can you think this is the kind of discourse that we want? Now, I, I'm not gonna defend some of the things that the president does, but at the same time, have we moved in that direction where manners or respect for the opposition, I mean, I, while I was in office and working with a governor on the other side, you would just never have done that. But today, it seems like it's okay to not have any manners in politics. Um, and, and that is both from the president as well as what we see happening in terms of the debate on the Democratic side. And I think that's the frustration, and some of it is back to the identity politics. We used to... We, 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 hang, we, hang, hang, hang on one second. Yeah, right. Jim, go ahead. We uh, used to all look at um, America as something we would try and universally get away from our identity politics and try and say, let's make this country and have goals that would improve it. That's why I mentioned the kinds of things that were successful on a bipartisan basis. We need to encourage that, not add to the diatribe on how we're not doing that. Okay. Um, gentleman in the back, Colin, then, then we'll come up front to this, this gentleman here. Um, I'd like to shift the focus a minute, um, since it's mostly white people here. Um, I think a, a, a lot of white people are scared. Um, that their life is gonna change radically. I, I, I used to be, in my 20s, really gung-ho for change, because I had nothing to lose. <laughs> and the older I've gotten, the more I have to lose. And some of it I'm willing to lose, and some of them I'm not. But my sense is that there's a ton of people who are white and frightened that the world is gonna turn upside down, That the, that things are gonna be taken away from them. Um, have you had success in dealing with people's fears of that sort of thing? Um, are there ways to have dialogue about that? Because I think it's a very deep-rooted reality right now, and I don't know how to, and I'm a trained psychologist and a, and a pastor, and I don't have a handle on how to do that. Fear. I wonder if any yeah. of you do. Yeah, does any, I mean, does anybody want to speak to, to I think you're right in terms of the, 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 the issue. I think there's a lot of fear. There's no question. And then, and I think the, this, the thing you said was, is um, are people afraid that things are going to be taken away from them or something like that? Um, does anybody, uh, there's fear. There's no question. So then the question is, what's the fear about? Does anybody want to speak to that? I don't know if, you know, anybody up here wants to speak to that? Well, when, when, I, when I say what is it about, I, I mean, what I always wonder is if you keep probing that and asking that question, what do you think is going to happen ultimately? Um, so you're afraid of this change, and maybe it's demographic or racial or what have you, so then what? What, what, what happens if the community is no longer 80 or 90 percent one race, it's now 70 or 65? I mean, this is, I've spent 20 years studying urban America, and this is the history of urban America, where, you know, cities changed and a lot of whites left, and they moved to the suburbs, and, and it's only in recent years that whites have started to move back in. Um, but in the modern context, you know, I'm not, I'm not quite positive, I, I, but I hear that all the time, and I think we all do. What, what is the fear ultimately about? Um, anybody have any insights on that? Or 
Well, so one thing I would add is that the research is really clear. And I mean, we see this, again, to go back to the example I used a minute ago about LGBT folks. Like, it really is contact. It's being in contact. And I think part of the problem is that because of a lot of policies that we've had in the United States, we are incredibly racially segregated. I mean, that's not a shock. It's not surprising that most of this room is white, right? I mean, I can tell you the housing policy. You can probably tell me the housing policy that led to that. Um, when we have contact, when we actually are with other people, a lot of that fear goes away. And I think it happens much more quickly than people think. And I say this based on the research that I've seen looking at neighborhoods and how quickly uh, folks' attitudes can shift once they truly live amongst each other and are with each other. But that is the challenge, is to be truly integrated because that's where you see that fear go away. I think that is the single best way to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yes, the, there's a woman right here in the middle. Yeah, I just wanted to bring up also, I don't know if any of you are familiar with him, but Bill Doherty has been on uh, Minnesota Public Radio a number of times, and he's a psychologist who teaches at the U, and he's part of an organization called Better Angels, and one of the things they've been doing is bringing people together from opposite sides of the fence. And their purpose, the, the one dialogue that I went to is called Red Blue. And they were bringing together Democrats and Republicans. And what they do is not try to change anyone's mind politically, but to get them to understand and have empathy for the viewpoint of the other side. Mm -hmm. And what we discovered in the workshop is we all had similar fears. Someone mentioned this too. It's what, how we decide or what we think about how we can solve them. That's where the problem comes in. But if you can get to the point where you can feel empathy for that person and their fear, it changes everything. Mm -hmm. Because you're willing to listen. You're willing to hear their point of view. And you know, you may not walk out best friends, but you walk out going, they're not evil. And right. I think that's a really key point. And if I may just say one more mm -hmm. thing. Um, this is gonna sound really weird, but I call it the gift of Trump. And what I mean by that is everybody I know, and I'm an artist uh, along with uh, a group here at the Phipps called What We Need Is Here, thanks to Anastasia. And I know for myself that when Trump got elected and as he was running, I had to step into my life in a whole different way. You can't pretend anymore, like this gentleman was saying and what you were saying about the panel, you can't pretend that this is all okay. It's not okay. And so my way of dealing with it was to reach out to people who were different than me, and I try to do it every day. And I've reached out to Muslims when I was at the office getting my you know, new license, and all kinds of people who are running around who are a lot more afraid than we are. And I've found that it has really enriched my life in ways that I could never anticipate. And just by being open, you know, not pulling in, but opening myself up, people are coming to me now. And it's just, I can't tell you how exciting that is for me. And I'm, you know, I'm not 20 years old. So to have those kinds of new experiences at this point in my life is really wonderful. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, um, you know, maybe, maybe one or two more questions, I think. Um, there's a gentleman right here. Colin, I see, and I am familiar with the organization um, Better Better Angels. I, I've not, I mean, I've, I've read about them. I'm familiar with them. So, um, so yeah, that's a that's an interesting story for sure. Yeah, mine is a statement of which uh, I've used a lot in my life. A famous American said something to the tune of, "Travel is the death of prejudice, bias, and narrow-mindedness." And I believe that's what you were saying up there. When you travel and find other people around the world, they want a lot of the same things that we have. Mm -hmm. It really opens people's minds to the fact that we should treat all, everybody with respect. Those of you who don't know, that was Mark Twain. Yeah, yeah. Is anybody looking around? Oh, wait, we have, okay. Maybe, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry, yeah, a couple more, I'm sorry. Uh, just to add uh, another comment to that, uh, St. Augustine, who uh, had his faults also, uh, but also believed in uh, if, if uh, your life is a book and you've never traveled, you've only read one page. Um, and I think um, 
my, uh, an, another passion that I've gotten involved in since uh, my retirement is youth exchange. Um, and I believe it was a, a president of Rotary who said if every 17-year-old did an international exchange, there would be no more war. Um, and I, I believe that putting, putting a young person in another environment and finding out how much they have in common rather than how different they are uh, brings them back with an, a perspective of um, a humanity that they didn't have uh, when they left. They grow a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Off of the quote about travel, and it connects with my original question is, um, I'll preface it, that travel is a privilege many people will never experience. Even leaving their communities is not a reality. And so that privilege that we have, most of us being white and uh, looking at the room about age, um, that we, to, to, to be about civility, we need to include everybody, including uh, race, age, socioeconomic status, gender, and education. So that being said, with communities like Hudson and, and others in the St. Croix Valley, how can we, a, a room basically full of white people, and with a primarily white panel, how do we include others? And I have my own you know, feelings about this, but I wanna you know, open it up to the, the panel. How can we facilitate this? Uh, I mean, having a discussion about civility doesn't really work if nobody else is here. Um, yeah, does anybody wanna speak to that <laughs> observation? Uh, may I? Yeah. Uh, just across the river in Afton, uh, two years ago, uh, we as the Muslim community established a, uh, a mosque. Uh, may, maybe you can see it from uh, uh, 94, especially during winter when there's no tree, uh, leaves, so you can see it very. So uh, it is very diverse. I mean, uh, I am the minority there. And uh, there's Muslims from all over the world. And maybe reaching out to them and bringing them in uh, for different events, not just panel. Uh, we have good speakers there also. And uh, that would be maybe one step. And, and I just, uh, this gentleman mentioned about the interfaith events he attended. And uh, we had uh, an open house last year. And uh, there were different churches invited, I believe. And I talked to a family, uh, a young family. I mean, they were younger than I was. And, but they had older kids, so uh, I still have young kids. So. And uh, I, I was very impressed about their curiosity to learn more about uh, about Islam, about my faith, and uh, I think I was encouraged to learn more about my own faith, and and somehow inform them better. Uh, I believe those type of activities uh, uh, would be uh, well suited for for such a collaboration. Yeah. Does anybody else want to speak to that one? Or yeah, John. I look around and I see a number of you were involved with the longer table that's been done the last couple summers. And I, I would like to believe that's a, a nice start, a nice foray of inviting people of diversity to come together. And hopefully it's a way that we show that we are not an exclusive community, but rather an inclusive community. So as somebody said earlier, I mean, I'd like to believe that it's, none of us is gonna change the world, but we can change a little bit. We can get to know one other person and make one positive step there. Yeah, um, do we have, okay, maybe one, maybe one more, I think, Colin. We have a gentleman, yeah, who's had his hand up here, and. Uh... Following up on something Senator Harsdorf said at the beginning, being educated. When I was in ninth grade at Hudson Junior High School, I took a course called American Studies. I still remember the teacher, Ms. Doucet. And we talked about specifically, it, was, it wasn't watching some TV show about how a bill becomes a law, but it was specifically, it talked about the three branches of government in this state and in this country. And to go back and to look at what is required now of the students, not just fourth grade to learn about the state of Wisconsin and then move on from there, 
But when you're in, in junior high or even into college at River Falls, when your predecessors, Dr. Berg, et cetera, were teaching political science, you learned about the government. And it goes back to a, a comment that was made to me about six weeks ago, that if the pundits that were offering all their opinions about constitutional law on TV or in the paper would be required before they could express those opinions, would take the naturalization test, the 100 question test, and get a 70% score. So going back from an educator and a former legislator, that is it required to go back to learn about American studies and to learn what it means with the three separate independent parts of our government, checks and balances. I agree. <laughs> Right on. <laughs> um, so I think, I mean, we're, we're a little bit, yeah, we're a little bit uh, past 8.30, um, and I just want to thank all of our panelists here, and I want to thank all of you for coming tonight. I think it was an excellent discussion, and, uh, you know, hopefully we can uh, continue these kinds of conversations um, elsewhere at other times. Thank you very much.